So welcome everyone to Psalms for Life, in which we explore a different chapter of Psalms each week. We want to thank Esther Alagorovich for sponsoring this class. It should be a merit and a source of bracha and hatzlacha for her and her entire family. Also, Esther Ella dedicates this class to the brave soldiers of the IDF and those who have lost their lives, Al-Kiddush Hashem. Also, I'd like to dedicate this class to two soldiers, Nir ben Nurit and Yehuda ben Livnat. At the end of this class, we will be saying uh, Tehillim together, and at that time, you can type in names about of who you would like us to keep in mind, but don't type in the names now until we get to the end of the class. So today we are doing a psalm that I didn't know was my favorite psalm <laughs> until I started learning it. So for now, it's my favorite. It's Psalm 48. And um, the segula for this psalm is to put fear in the heart of our enemies. Okay. So it's not such a, like, we're not such a, uh, a uh, vengeful people at all, anything like this, but we want our enemies to be afraid. But what do we, th we want them to be afraid of? Us? Not necessarily. We want them to be afraid of Hashem. And as we go through this Psalm, which is actually about Jerusalem, the beautiful city of Yerushalayim, we will see that the appreciation of Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, okay, um, which really can be broken down into meeting Yira Shalem, perfect fear, okay, or perfected fear or awe. As we go through this, we will see that in order for our enemies, the people who want to destroy us, hurt us, and so on, in order for them to have this appreciation for Yerushalayim, to have this uh, uh, Yira Shalem, this perfected fear, that that the whole the whole shift of the world will need to happen, and we are undergoing that shift right now, and we're going to talk about that. Um. So. This psalm describes the glory and beauty of Jerusalem, not only when Mashiach comes, but also in the past, but especially when in the past and the present at the times where it was and will no longer be in ruins. So we have to ask, this is what our sages taught about the psalm. We look around Jerusalem today, it's gorgeous. It's, it doesn't look like it's in ruins. So specifically, I think it's quite obvious, it's referring to the Beis Hamikdash, the Beit Hamikdash, the Holy Temple. And the uh, it's alluding to the spiritual ruins, which we find ourselves in. The Jewish people and the world as a whole, we find ourselves, and, and certainly since October 7th, we can feel it the space in our heart that is unsure, that is apprehensive, that's wondering what will come next. And that space in those ruins per se, the destruction, the spiritual destruction inside each of us can only be healed by turning to Hashem. Okay, it's the only, we can do everything else we want. We, we should, we should fight, we should have a, um, act in politics, we should speak out, we should unite, we should do all kinds of things, but the main shift will occur when we turn to Hashem. Now, Rav Hirsch, who I, I really just, his commentary on Tehillim is so amazing, he describes how Hashem's greatness is revealed only when the other nations recognize and worship him. And of course, we know that Rabbi Nachman says that the greatest glory of Hashem is when those who are far away come to him, return to him. And Rav Hirsch says specifically that this only happens through who? Through the Jewish people. 
We have the most important role of bringing the whole world to this realization of Hashem. Do we do this directly by speaking to them? Some people do. But we do this when the Gentile world sees our plight and sees what we're going through. And they have these aha moments and they wake up one by one, one by one, one by one. And they say, wow, if you look at the story of the Jewish people, you see their history. Ah, I can believe in God. I see without the way they've been removed from their land, come back to their land, the suffering they've undergone and so on, then they'll believe in Hashem. This is also, this Psalm 48 is also the Shir Shel Yom of Yom Sheni, the, the song of the day of, of Monday. Monday, um, during the service in the Beis HaMikdash, and of course, we still say it today, and it's alluding to the second day of creation when Hashem separated between heaven and earth and ruled over everything. And this separation, and it also says in the Zohar Kodesh, the upper waters and lower waters were divided this day. This is the root of all division, conflict, and strife in this world. This is the day, because not today is Tuesday, but yesterday. Yom Sheni, Monday, the second day of the week is the day when division, conflict, and strife were created, for lack of a better term, because it's it's the root of all of them, rather than each specific one. And the Zohar says this is the day Gehinnom was created. Okay, And the Talmud says that if you were born on a Monday, you're going to have a bad temper. Why? Because it's the root of all division and strife. So I was born on a Monday. <laughs> I've worked on my temper, Baruch Hashem. I've really worked on my temper. Um, but if it's if you were born on a Monday, it's something to think about. Okay. Um, like, like everything else in our beautiful, beautiful Torah, change is always possible. Okay. You know the expression, people never change, not us. We, we don't have that expression. We say people can always change. People can always choose to change. Okay, what motivates them to change? That's a whole other topic. We could get to that another time. Okay, we will begin with uh, verse one. Um, one second, please. Okay. Shir Mizmor Livne Korach. Okay. It's a song with musical accompaniment by the sons of Korach. So the Zohar Kodesh says that why it begins Shir Mizmor, a song, a, 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 a psalm or a musical accompaniment. Okay, it can be translated a few different ways. Mizmor, we spoke about uh, Zemir and Zmiros last time. The Zohar says that this double musical reference, Shir Mizmor, signifies that this is a very important psalm. Okay, just like Shir Hashirim, Song of Songs. When there's a double, we pay extra attention to it. Okay, so we pay extra attention to all the songs, but let's pay some extra attention to this one as well. Okay. Gadol Adonai Umhulal Ma'od. Be'ir Eloheinu Har Kadosho. Okay. Great is Hashem. And very much praised in our city of God, the Mount of His Holiness, or we could say the Mount of His Sanctuary. So especially on the Mount, okay, which is really Har Habayis, He will be praised specifically in the past, His name of 72, Hashem's name of 72 letters, because Hashem has many names, okay, was able to be pronounced on the mount in the Kadosh Kadoshim by the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur. That is considered to be one of the ultimate ways to praise Hashem. Also, I think I mentioned in the last class that when Mashiach comes, all of Israel will be like Yerushalayim, okay, and Israel will expand, and that the um, Beit Hamikdash 
will cover all of what is currently Yerushalayim. That detail I didn't mention last week. And this is what will happen when, when Mashiach comes. And this is going to happen and result in the extensive, the very, very great praise of God. Because we're going to see this expansion of um, the holiness of the Beha Mikdash, and then the holiness of Yerushalayim, and then the holiness of Israel. Now, Al Sheikh says that when the city of Hashem is built up, obviously Hashem is going to be more recognized and more praised, Mehulal Ma'od, like I said, Um Hulal Ma'od, because the power of the Shrina okay, is going to be everywhere. But even now, we extensively praise Hashem because the power of the Shekhinah can't ever be chased away from the Western law, okay? This is a cause for us to bring great praise, to speak our praise out loud. And I want to tell you, for those of you who hopefully are engaging in Heek Bodedut, okay, speaking to Hashem in your own words about whatever's on your mind and in your heart, one of the aspects of Hippodadut is to praise and thank Hashem for what you have in your life. And that little nugget of praise joins in with all the other praise and thanks of Hashem that goes on all over the world. Okay. And it's it's something that will set the tone for your Hippodadut, even if you're coming to speak to Hashem for confession, or you're coming to cry out because you lack something. Once we praise and thank Hashem, we ourselves undergo a change. And that's why it's so important to begin with praise and thanks as this Psalm does. And as, as our uh, prayers do as well, our, our, our um, daily prayers do. Rebbe Nachman says, when is Hashem great? He asks, well, could take more on lesson 10 for anybody's interested. When is Hashem great? When his house of prayer, okay, the holy temple is a, is a house of prayer for all nations. Okay, and I alluded to this before that when anybody who's distant from Hashem comes closer to Hashem that we saw in, um, we saw in, in Yitra last week's Parsha, okay? And this idea of a house of prayer for all nations, you know, we get, we have no choice but to be very focused on the Jewish people. And we should be, because if we're not focused on us, nobody else is going to help us. We do have to focus on us. But ultimately, the end goal is for all creation, everybody to praise Hashem. And we can keep that in mind without diluting our precious and dear connection to our Jewish brothers and sisters. At the same time, right now isn't always the time to reach out to the rest of the world. We might have moments where we can, but we have to also remember who we should focus on. And that's our brothers and sisters, especially when they're in peril. Okay, let's continue with Gimel with verse three. Um, Yefe nof, now this is beautiful. Yefe nof misos kol ha'aretz, hart siyon, yar kisei tzafon, kirias melech rav. It's so beautiful. The fairest of sights or views, places. The fairest of sights. The joy of all the earth. Hart siyon, Mount Zion, by the north side, the city of a great king. So Rashi translates Nof, not as sights. Everybody knows Har Nof, okay? The, the mountain of views or the mountain of sights. Rashi doesn't translate it as Nof. He translates it as a branch, specifically referring to the Mount of Olives. Also, as a branch nourishes many smaller branches and twigs, Yerushalayim nourishes the world. And he says that Jerusalem is the world's root or trunk. We know this idea, of course, this is a very, it's a very Kabbalistic idea that the roots of Jerusalem are in Hashemayim. And therefore, the roots on this earth nourish 
and give sustenance and spiritual sustenance to the entire world. There's something about that city that is absolutely necessary to the, um, to the existence of the world and the sustenance of the world. Without it, I don't know that there would be a world. Um, Nof, of course, is generally translated as scythe, sight or landscape or view. Chazal say that Israel is the ultimate nof, the ultimate site or place. It has the most perfect climate. It has the most perfect air. Why? So Chazal say the air of Israel, the air of Yerushalayim specifically makes one wise. Okay. And Rabbi Nachman speaks about how the air of Israel, he has a lot of lessons on this, but how the, when he went and breathed in his air in the air of Israel, took a few steps in Israel, his Daladamos, his few his four steps in Israel, he said it changed him so dramatically that the lessons he taught before he went to Israel and returned versus the lessons he taught afterwards, they were as nothing. The previous lessons. Now, of course, when we read the early lessons, they're not as nothing. They're ah, oh, they're brilliant and, and exciting and and sometimes obtuse, but always, always rich in layers and layers of meanings. But often we see some of the later lessons are shorter and they contain nuggets of truth that don't need complex and detailed um, explanations to get to. They're just, they're just very available for us. I don't know if that's what he means by how they changed. By the way, that's what I've noticed about some of the later lessons. Okay. All right. So this is another thing about Israel being the most perfect of climates. Everything grows in Israel from all climates. Everything grows there whether it's alpine or tropical or subtropical or temperate. Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, famously had a garden in which he grew fruits, and vegetables, fruit trees, vegetables, flowers, spices, okay? Everything from all around the world. He was able to grow this. Why? So first of all, there is a special climate there is a special climate in which um in which it nurtures uh it nurtures growth but more than that israel has in it the source of all the meridians these are like veins like anybody who knows about acupuncture knows we have according to Chinese medical theory, we have meridians running through our body. The Zohar teaches about um, different um, different streams or different energy centers of our body and so on. Israel is like that. Israel has the source of all the meridians that go out and flow out through the world. These are, these are really energy lines. And Rebbe Nachman explains that if you know the where a meridian is, where an energy line is, you can grow a tropical plant in a, in, a, in a northern climate. Now, whenever I think of this, I always think of, um, I, I spent time in a lot of different countries. One of the places was Ireland on the rugged, rugged West Coast in cold in the bitter winter, and there were palm trees growing there. Okay. It's, it's quite a, a, an amazing concept. Now, of course, we see this in Israel, too. Israel, we know, has the ability to do this, but it's quite interesting to see that these meridians extend out throughout the world. Um, and, and Shlomo HaMelech, being the wisest man in the world, knew where those meridians were. He was able to assess that, which is why he had the most incredible gardens ever seen. Okay. Um, also, Yerushalayim is the fairest site. It's the most beautiful. It's we can't even express its beauty. And every nation recognizes this, which is why they fight over it. They all want it. It's so crazy. They all want it. And they give religious reasons and political reasons, this reason. But the truth is, is it's holy beauty. People feel it. They're drawn to it. Okay. Talmud says that 10 measures of beauty were given to the world. And Yerushalayim took 
nine. So why was it the joy of the earth? Beauty we got, but why the joy? So Rashi says, it's, it's really quite simple. A person could arrive in Yerushalayim on a pilgrimage, okay? With a weight on his heart, sadness because of the missteps he made in his life and so on. And he could bring an offering to the base of Igdash, okay, to the temple, and he could attain atonement and forgiveness, could rectify everything, could attain a tikkun, and then he would feel light and filled with joy. In other words, joy and the joy of Jerusalem comes from shedding all our baggage. That's really what the joy is. We feel light. We feel like we've made corrections and we should make corrections when we go there. It's very important when traveling to Israel, for those of you in Israel, to do our best to really respect the holiness of the place and the power it can, in a way, even confer on us in order to help us lift ourselves up. Do tshuva, return to Hashem. Okay. Also, the offerings would bring bracha, bring sustenance to the entire world. Okay. When the Beis HaMikdash was standing, our sages actually say that when the, if the nations knew what they did with the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash, how they hurt themselves, they would just, they would just do so much chuba. It would tear them up. Okay. It would tear them up if they destroyed it because it brings sustenance, which brings joy to the whole world. And it brings a connection with Hashem, okay? When we have that joy, as Rebbe Nachman tells us again and again and again, okay? Mitzvah gedola, leo simcha, Tommy. It's a very big mitzvah. It's a great mitzvah to be joyful all the time, continuously. It's a mitzvah to be joyful. The only way to be joyful is to connect to this idea of we have to shed all the stuff, the baggage, we have to get rid of it, we have to do tshuva, and we have to connect to Hashem. And Yerushalayim is the main source and place of that, and the Beis HaMikdash will be, it's Hashem very soon in our time, the place where we can finally all breathe that huge sigh of relief and then go about our business. What is our business? It's being joyful that we're alive. That's really our business, okay? Hashem created me, I'm so happy, okay? So that's our business. That's our That's our ultimate kind of, ethos as, as the Jewish people. All right. Um, Hart Sion says Rav Hirsch. Okay, so I mentioned Hart Sion in this verse. It's related to Sion, the word Sion. Okay, same word, different vowel. It's a Sion is a memorial or gravesite marker. When we say we're going to Rabbi Nachman Sion in, in Uman, we're going to his gravesite marker, the marker, the memorial where his grave is. And when it's spelled Sion, which it translates in English as Zion, okay, it refers to the site of the Beit HaMikdash. It's a timeless memorial, says Rav Hirsch, for truth. Okay. So Zion, okay, when people say they're a Zionist, okay, what they really should be thinking is, I am all about supporting the memorial dedication and the rebuilding of the Beit HaMikdash for the sake of truth. And of course, Emet, Emes, truth, is one of the names of Hashem. So we connect to that idea also that the Beit HaMikdash is a place where Hashem's truth can dwell and radiate out throughout the whole world. Okay, let's continue. Um, Okay. Okay. So, um, sorry. Okay. It's, oh, um, Kiryas Melech Rav, the city of a great king. Who's the great king? Mashiach. Mashiach is a great king. David also, by the way. I can also say David, but, but Mashiach. All right. Let's continue with Dalad. Um, Elohim ba'arma no seha no dalamis gav. Okay. Hash, uh, Hashem is in her palaces known as a stronghold. So why is the gender her palaces? Because it's referring to the Shekhinah, the divine presence, the indwelling aspect of Hashem, which is referred to as a feminine. 
And this is referring to Hashem dwelling in her palaces or the Shekhinah dwelling there rather as the first and second base Hamikdash. That's what our sages say. And I'm assuming it also means the third, the third palace as well. Okay. Um, let's continue. Ki hine hamalachim no adu avaru yachdav. Um, so, um, but, uh, uh, for behold, the kings have assembled. They've come together. Rashi says this refers to the armies of Gog and Magog assembling to attack Jerusalem. And then they'll fall. When we see, when we see this, people ganging up on Yerushalayim, okay, they'll fall. We should believe and know that they'll fall. And I want to say something. I've mentioned this before. Is this attack physical war or is this attack a political war, a policy war, an international, like bringing people to the international court? Who knows? You see that they all attacked together and even they had to admit failure. So we see this a lot, but there will be a final attack, whether again, it might be physical, God willing, it won't be. Uh, and then they'll fall. We have to constantly renew our amuna and our bitachon, our faith and our trust that Hashem's going to take care of it. Okay. All right. We will continue. Um, let me see. Vav 6. Hema ra'u kein tamahu nivhalu nech pazu. They saw and... <clears throat> Excuse me. They saw and they were right away astounded. They were terrified and they fled in haste. Um, when the kings of all the nations saw Hashem's miracles in the past, they were terrified. We know this. Okay. We, we, we know this from our Torah. And Sforno confirms this, that this describes the monarchs of old who came to visit Jerusalem. But what were was Hashem's miracles in Jerusalem? It wasn't the splitting of the Red Sea there. It wasn't anything like that. Incredible words, he says. The kings, the monarchs are of old, were awed by the incredible wisdom, scholarship, and kedusha of the Jewish people that they saw in Jerusalem. They were awed by the Jews. And this harkens back to the beginning of our little talk here, where we're speaking about Yisrael, the Jewish people being the ones through our own history and our own potential for greatness that changes the minds of the world, okay? That awes them, that shakes them up. And each of us has this inside. Each of us has this ability to connect to our Nakuda Tova, to bring it forth, to develop it, to connect to our good point and to develop it and bring it out and be a, a role model, an example, not only to the Jewish people, our families, our friends. We should all we should all strive for that. Every single one of us should be an example to every one of other one of us, but also to the world at large. Then they'll flee from the fighting. They'll start to think, says our sages. Okay, let's continue. Um, Zion seven, Raada Achazasam Sham Chil Kayo Leda. Trembling gripped them and they convulsed and had convulsions like a woman in labor. We'll go with a simple meaning. We'll continue. Beruah Kadim Tishaber Anios Tarshish. Okay. With an east wind, you break the ships of Tarshish. We've spoken about Tarshish before being a place of trade. There's arguments. We've discussed this in the past about where Tarshish is. Rashi says this east wind is the wind Hashem uses to punish the, just like the Egyptians were swept into the Yam Suf 
with a strong eastern wind, that's always the wind that Hashem uses to enact retribution. And why does he punish? Okay. It's not just punishing to punish. It's punishing because of justice. A wrong has to be righted. Okay. This, this is... This form of punishment is always true justice because it comes from Hashem. Also, um, also this might refer this um, this east wind and the breaking of the ships might actually refer to something that happens with the seas during Gog and Magog. And I was thinking about tsunamis, and what flashed to my mind, of course, was that Japanese tsunami, which, if I have it correct, was in two thousand eleven. I I didn't prepare this, so I don't remember. Um, and there were reasons why Japan was chosen at that time. And our, our Rabbanim had, had insights into it. And, you know, when we see natural disasters, what's the point of them? Our sages tell us, whenever we see a natural disaster, we should look in the mirror and do tshuva. Hashem's giving us a warning. Okay? It's, it's quite amazing. All right, let's continue. Nine. Um, Ka'asher shamanu, sorry, Ka'asher shamanu kain ra'inu, be'ir Adonai tzivaos, be'ir Eloheinu Elohim, yechoneneha ad olam selah. Okay, as we heard, so we saw in the city of Hashem of legions, in the city of our God, may Hashem, may God establish it forever and ever selah. So we heard from our forefathers about the wonders of the past and also prophecies of what will happen with Gog and Magog. And we saw, as we heard and as we saw, previous prophecies came true. We discuss this all the time. We discuss the story of Rabbi Akiva, the foxes. I won't tell it again. I tell it a lot. Okay. But the wonders of the past came true. So... We say, may Hashem establish it forever and ever because we have total faith and trust and hope that the prophecies that pertaining to today and to Gog and Magog and to Mashiach also come true. And Radak reminds us, the city of Hashem, Siv, Aos, the, the lead, Hashem of the legions, ultimately it's Hashem who causes our enemies to rise against us so that Hashem will defeat them. Keep that in mind both on a personal level and a, a big level, a national level. Hashem causes our enemies to rise against us. Anytime we face an obstacle, an obstruction, somebody thwarting us, let alone our big enemies, this is from Hashem. It's a message from Hashem. It's, a, um, it, it's part of what we have to go through. At the same time, the whole point of all the suffering and obstacles and 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 things that we face that we don't like the whole point of all these enemies what is to is to motivate us to turn to hashem you know sometimes you'll see somebody will go through a very hard time okay and suddenly they will turn towards hashem even if they've never turned towards hashem before we're seeing in this war Please, Hashem, it should end. Everybody should come home safely. Our enemies should be defeated. Not one minute more of this war should happen. But we see every day people are telling me, people I know in Israel, I'm also getting people sending me videos, but people I actually know tell me their cousin saw a miracle on the battlefield. There's a story that I just read that, that nobody told me. I actually just read it. It wasn't personally known to me. But it... Um, a man, a soldier, was an IDF soldier, was fighting, and his rav told him, no matter what, you must daven mincha. You must daven mincha, the afternoon prayers. And he was with his troops, and it was mincha time, and mincha was about to be over. And what did he do? All of a sudden, all of a sudden, he, he said, I got to daven mincha, and he turned east. Okay, he turned east. This is in the, it's in uh, the, the Jewish news. He turned east to David Mincha and he saw Hamas sneaking up on them. And they were all able, they were all been facing the other way. They were expecting Hamas to come from the west. 
And they all were able to completely decimate this, this group of terrorists. Oh, Hashem. So we see miracles every day. And we see that this motivates people to turn to Hashem. Okay, let's continue. Um, okay, Yud. Uh, di, uh, di, uh, diminu Elohim chasdecha bekerev he chalecha. Um, dimin, we hoped Hashem for your kindness in the midst of your sanctuary or your palace. Okay. So diminu is translated here by Rashi as hope. We hoped Hashem for your kindness. Others translate it to mean we think about. Uh, the word dame is, is to have an imagination about, to be fully engaged in a thought. Rebbe Nachman says we have uh, this medame, uh, this kind of imagination that often veers off into the negative. However, we can use it, we should use it, to veer off into the positive. How, you know, we should be having positive, not fantasies, but using our imagination to dis, to focus on the joy we're going to have because of Hashem's kindness and the greatness of Hashem when the Beis HaMikdash will be built, will be revealed to all. This is, we should be thinking about this. Rabbi Nachman says we should wake up every morning, open our eyes, we say, Mal-da'ani. we open our eyes, and say Moda'ani, we should think immediately about the ultimate purpose of our lives and life in general. The ultimate purpose is Olam Haba, the world to come, which has two meanings, of course. It means when we go into the next world as individuals, okay, after 120, please Hashem. But also when Mashiach comes, this is the ultimate purpose. We should be thinking about this. We should be training our minds to think about this. All the stuff that's coming into our minds at all times. We think our thoughts happen to us. But Rabbi Nachman says, no. We have the power to think as an active verb, to use our thoughts, our imagination, to construct holiness within our minds. And when we do that, know what he says that's where we live that's our reality okay that's our reality it's it's like living in the same life the same body the same apartment the same house the same world the same date and time except you're living a completely different life an utterly different life and each of you each and me we all have the power to do this okay let's continue um <coughs> Let's continue. I'm losing my voice. Yud Aleph 11. Kishimcha Elohim came to Hilascha al Katzve Eretz. Sedek Malaa Yiminecha. Okay. Like your name, O Hashem, so is your praise to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. Hashem truly lives up to his praise. His name and his praise are one. Uh, humans, on the other hand, our names and our praise, so not so much. But Hashem, when we praise him, and we're praising his name, we understand that his name, all his names, but his name and Hashem can't be separated out from, from Hashem himself. Nothing can be separated out from Hashem. This is something to praise, something to think about. Let's continue. Um, Yismach Hart Sion Tagelma Benos Yehuda Lemaan Mishpatecha. Um, uh, may Hart Sion, may Mount Zion rejoice, may the daughters, um, Benos Yehuda, uh, uh, Benos Yehuda, may the daughters of Yehuda rejoice because of your judgments. So how can we rejoice because of Hashem's judgments? So the judgments here are referring to the destruction of the Bes HaMikdash. That's what they're referring to. How are we supposed to rejoice? So we're supposed to rejoice is 
in, in two ways, and there could possibly be more. The first is, is we should thank Hashem that he took his judgments out on stone and wood and not us. Took it out on a building and not the Jewish people. Okay, that that was his justice for our really going way off. He didn't, he didn't kill us, Baruch Hashem. He didn't destroy the Jewish people. Next, the prophecies about the previous temple being built, destroyed, and rebuilt, and destroyed came true. So we can rejoice. Right now, we can rejoice that the prophecies of the third Samikdash are going to come true very soon, hopefully, in our time. It feels like it's going to be very, very soon. I don't know how the world, I don't know about you, but I literally do not know how the world can survive. Every day I, I wake up and I say, how is the world going to survive another day without Mashiach? How is this possible? It's so crazy. Okay, let's continue. Okay. Um, you know, Re Rebbe Nachman says, sometimes you have to be a little foolish and do foolishness and silliness in order to bring yourself to joy. Uh, you know, I have to say that that if I didn't, I, I don't know how I would cope with what's going on in the world. I don't know how each of us would cope. We have to bring ourselves to joy. And we have to rely on the fact that our prophets have always been true in the past. They're going to be true now. Okay. Sobo tzion v'hakifuha. Sifru migdaleha. So walk around or walk about um, Zion, walk around Zion and, and encircle her and count her towers. Rashi says that this is, this is beautiful. This is going to be the architect's the engineers, the construction crews, they're going to walk around Sion, Hart Sion, the mount, and they're going to be measuring out how they're going to build the Beis HaMikdash. Okay? They're going to be figuring out how they're going to build it, where they're going to go, and what they're going, which, what things should go where, which piece should go where. And there, this is the, the are also going to figure out how to build the rest of your slime if it needs some building. And it will, because we know that Hartzion is going to expand in a way. Can't envision that now. We don't know what that means. So um, Ibn Ezra says something different. He says this verse, walk around Zion and encircle her counter towers. This refers to the nations. It's an instruction to them to come and walk around and admire Jerusalem, come, come to the holy city. You'll be changed by it. And, you know, I will tell you that some people come and they're missionaries and all these terrible people who are actually trying to missionize the Jews in Jerusalem. It irritates me. It hurts me that Israel allows them to scream. They go to the most religious late neighborhoods and they stand on the street corners and they scream. A lot of these people, for some reason, are from Asian countries. Their, their Christianity has hit them very hard. And they stand and they scream at the Jews. And they're not experiencing the holiness of the Jews. They're blind to it. But Ibn Ezra says, no, everybody's capable of opening their eyes and experiencing the holiness of the city and the Jewish people if they want to. Okay. Um Hold on a second. Okay. Okay. And once again, I messed up, messed up the numbering. Okay. Shiso libechem lechela. Pasagu armino seha lemaan tisapru ledur aharo. Mark well her rampart, ramparts. Okay, mark well in your hearts her ramparts, her high walls. Raise up her palaces that you may tell it to future generations. So the Medrash says literally, literally that you should mark this in your hearts. And it says something very interesting. The human heart should be spelled with a double base. It should be levavechem, okay? But that's not what we read here. We read libechem, not levavechem. Why is this? 
So the human heart should be spelled levavachem because it's a double, because it has both the good and evil inclination, which is why it gets the letter base, the letter bed twice, okay? But the hearts of angels are libachem, which is what I read. And they only use one bit because angels only have a good inclination. They were created only to do one mission with a good inclination. So it's referring to the future here. It's so beautiful that when Mashiach comes, we're only going to have a Yitzhak Tov. We're only going to have a good inclination. So our hearts are no longer, when it refers to us, the Jewish people, going to be spelled Levavachem. It's going to be spelled Libachem, like the angels with one bit, because our inclination will be one. We're only going to want to do good. We're only going to want to do good, which is amazing. Um, also, this is tell your children about how Jew beautiful Jerusalem was so that they will look forward to an even more beautiful Ir HaKodesh, holy city in the future. And we should. You have children at home. Some of you have grandchildren. Just be speaking about Jerusalem. I know someone, I know more than one person, but I know someone who built for her children and now her grandchildren models, she and her husband, of Jerusalem, specific with a specific emphasis on the base on Migdash. You can actually buy models of the Holy Temple online. How it will look in the future, we're not 100% sure what the third temple will look like. Um, Ram Chal has some ideas about that. But built these models so that they could discuss it with their children and they would lay it out on the dining room table, even though they could, this one family had plenty of other rooms on the dining room table all week long to talk about. And they're doing it with their grandchildren too. Beautiful. How beautiful. This is what you should be talking about with your kids. Okay. Okay. Yes. You have to talk about what do you want for dinner, but this too. All right. Let's continue. Kiza Elohim Eloheinu. Olam va'ed. Hu yinahagenu al mus. Because this is Elohim Elohenu. Hashem our God forever and ever. He will guide us almost. So what does almost mean? So it can be translated as like children. Okay. Rashi reads almost to mean like children as one word. Others say almost is was written as two words, and it means until our death, till we die, Hashem will guide us forever and ever. And even then, he's still going to guide us because we're eternal. Jewish people's eternal, your neshama's eternal. Others say this means that we dance around Hashem and he's going to lead us through this world and the next forever and ever. And Rob Hirsch says almost means he's going to make us eternal. We thought we were eternal, but he's going to make us even more eternal. Whatever that means, I don't know why. We can't ask Rob Hirsch, but hopefully one day we'll find out. So. This beautiful song, I, I, I have to tell you, I'm so touched by, by you. All I do is I really want to be in your shrine. I really want to be there every day. I say to my husband, when are we going? When are we going to be able to go? When are we going to be able to make Aliyah? When are we going to be able to be in your shrine? And, you know, reading this psalm and studying it, I never studied this psalm before for the first time brings us to a place where we yearn for Mashiach. We yearn for Yerushalayim. We yearn for Heart Zion. We yearn for to see that blossoming in its fullness in the way it should be and in the way our people should be, all of us in the land, experiencing the joy of shedding that Yetzir Hara, shedding that negative inclination, sh shedding all the burden of oh, all the times we did things that we didn't know what we were doing and we shouldn't have done them. And we're going to get rid of all that. And we're going to move forward in positivity. And and uh, Doris has a quote here, wherever I go, I'm going to Jerusalem. Rabbi Nachman also said, I'm going to Israel. Okay. We could say it two ways. So, but it's true. Okay. And, and that shows us that his thoughts were always on Eretz Yisrael. He always thought about it, which is why 
which is why as soon as you can go there, as soon as you can go there to live, if you're not already there. Okay. If, if I can encourage other people to go, uh, maybe the sluice will be enable me to go. And if you're already there, you know, just share that joy with the rest of us out here, out here in, uh, in, in deep Gullis. Okay. And then God willing, Mashiach is going to be here very soon. And we will all be able to experience the joy of um, the joy of greeting the Mashiach together speedily in our time. Okay. Let's look and see if there are any questions. Uh, Oh, the lessons in, in volume two, the, your, um, our, the, the lessons for Lakute Moron after Israel, volume two. Um, okay, that question was answered. Wonderful wisdom. Uh, this is really beautiful from Naomi. Uh, amazing how these words of Tehillim can come, be so alive and relevant to whatever we are experiencing throughout our history. So needed to hear all this. Hashem bless you and everyone listening should be blessed. I do want to say that, you know, right now, people are so driven to say Psalms and to experience Psalms. And people I know who, including myself, who said, I still say massive amounts of Tehillim every day. I do. But I'm slowing down a little bit, making a little more time so that I can pay a little bit more attention to the words. Because when we rush through, you know, we, we want to say a lot of Psalms. It's very good to say a lot. Don't skip, okay? Don't skip any Psalms that you're, that you're committed to saying each day. But at the same time, try to allow extra time so you can really appreciate the beauty of our wonderful King David's um, words and music, the music, we can feel the music of the Tehillim. And one day, God willing, we're going to be able to experience it in the Beis HaMikdash with the Levium, with a choir of the Levites singing in 72 art harmony. I look forward to it. Okay, let me turn off the um, camera so we can say Tehillim.